Truth versus social justice. And you know where I am? Truth. Period. Okay, not period. Look, as I always say, nuance in all things. For the most part, truth is one of the most important things. But you'd be a fool to say that people don't lie. And I, I, I just watched this interview with Jordan Peterson in GQ, so I'm pulling a bunch of quotes from it. But Jordan Peterson, when asked if he's ever lied, he says, everybody lies. And then the interviewer, in spectacular fashion, says to quote Dr. House or something of that nature. And I thought it was fantastic. If you're not familiar with Dr. House, he says everybody lies. They do. Not everything is 100% truthful. Now, I try to be as completely honest as possible. The only, the only time I'm ever, in my opinion, dishonest will be to protect the security of an individual. If I need to, you know, deflect, if, if somebody's trying to find out a source's information or trying to cause harm to somebody, I might try and deflect to push someone away. But I, that's extremely rare. For the most part, it's to protect someone's feelings on, on minor issues, to which I actually still disagree with for the most part. Like, if someone comes to me and says, do I look fat? I'll say yes if you do and no if you don't. But sometimes I'll try and spare people's feelings because I'm not a tactless individual. But this story, to the point, academic recognition shouldn't hinge on a scholar's moral character. This story from The Atlantic, which I, I probably won't read through the whole thing, talks about how we're questioning the morality of people doing research to question their research. We shouldn't. Ignore the morality of the individual and challenge the data or the ideas they present. That should be the way things go for the most part, like 99.9%. .9%. I recognize there's still room for some reason, you know, it just depends. What he writes, what is the telos, the purpose and or goal of the university? In a thought provoking 2016 lecture, the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt argued that the answer ought to be truth, but that lately more of America's top universities are embracing social justice as a second or alternative telos. While acknowledging that those goals are not always at odds, he argued that the conflict between truth and social justice is likely to become unmanageable. And he argued academia to affirm the, primary, the, the primacy of truth-seeking. A recent essay in the Chronicle of Higher Education recognizes the same conflict but implies that it sometimes ought to be resolved in other direction. Its author, Nikki Usher, asks, Should we still cite the scholarship of serial harassers and sexists? If the research is good and sound, the answer is yes. It is a bind that we have yet to account for, she argues. How the process of building an academic work itself burnishes the reputations of people whose scholarship is good and sometimes even foundational, but whose characters are awful. In the case of a sexist jerk, you are often left without recourse. Cite him or look like you don't know what you're talking about to reviewers and readers. Usher notes that peer reviewers once asked her to cite the work of a professor whose scholarship was substantively relevant, but who has been fairly awful toward me and other women, although just a sexist jerk, not a sexual harasser. Declaring herself unsure about what to do, she concludes that the best strategy may be a somewhat sketchy one suggested by a friend. Do what the editor wanted so that when he sent the revised manuscript back to reviewers, they would see I had followed their instruction and added the requisite citation. Then, when I got the manuscript back before final publication, surreptitiously remove the citations. Why not simply cite the work? For those men whose academic sexism hasn't risen to the level of actionable correction, and very likely won't, while they continue ignoring female scholars and belittling the work on a daily basis, their reputation overall will remain clean. A serial sexist is unlikely to cite the work of female scholars, but if he is a predominant voice in your field or subfield, there is no way for you to avoid having to continue to build his academic reputation through citations, even if you would like to avoid doing so. We have not tackled the question of how scholarship in journal articles and books amplifies the reputation and credibility of people who do not deserve that recognition. Full stop. Let's say this. What we're talking about here is perception and ideology. She says this person hasn't done anything actionable, which would imply that based on the rules of our society, the individual did not do anything wrong other than personally slight you. Let's take it to its logical conclusion then. What you are saying is that if someone acts in a way that you do not like, you do not believe you should cite scientific data and research. This is wrong. Let's say there's a Christian scholar who says, I absolutely refuse to cite the work of a Muslim scholar. That would be wrong, and vice versa. If the data is true and correct, and we have reason to believe that to the best of their abilities, they presented true and correct information, that information is extremely relevant and should play a role. This is an argument for restricting the name and the credit to an individual simply because you don't like how they behave personally. Well, I got news for you. It's legal to be a mean person. It straight up is. And what we're seeing here is a continued erosion of civility, the continued erosion of the social contract. The idea that there are certain things you're allowed to do even if you don't like them. 
But we're also seeing that people are eroding academia, that they're willing to remove fact if they don't like the individual. We can't have a society that functions that way. What if someone comes to you and says, my child needs medicine, and you think, well, Bob down the street has the medicine, but he's kind of a dick, so I'm not going to tell him he exists. I'll tell him how to make the medicine, but I don't want credit going to Bob. What if, uh, and that's a bit of an extreme example, but maybe you go and get it, don't tell him how to get it. You're restricting information because you don't like someone personally. It's not an appropriate thing to do, and it's bad for science. One implication of this argument is that scholarly recognition should hinge not only on a scholar's contribution to advancing human knowledge or his utility to present and, uh, present and future scholars, but on his character, their utility, their character, because we're, we're not gendered here, okay? You can be a female scientist, and I mean that for, for real, but I'm kind of just being a dick. Moving on. The consequence of that mindset could be far-reaching, Usher writes. Consider the case of Nobel Prize winning scientist James Watson, who with Francis Crick is credited with discovering the structure of DNA and led the Human Genome Project for years Watson was revered. Then in 2007, he publicly took issue with the idea that all races have equal intelligence. Watson told the British newspaper that people who have to deal with black employees find this not true. Watson is now known as a notorious sexist and racist who failed to acknowledge the research contributions of his colleague, Rosalind Franklin but we haven't stopped citing and mentioning Watson and Crick because, well, DNA. Is that a problem? Usher doesn't commit, but adds. In the present day creative arts, at least reputations suffer by exclusion, such as removing the artwork of a serial harasser from public display, sometimes only temporarily, or no longer choosing to include poems by outed sexual harassers in various best of collections. That may not be the best uh, tack to take, but it is at least an acknowledgement that scholars' questionable behavior needs to be raised as a factor in their reputation, even if their work is itself good. Now, here's where I will bring about the balance of my opinion. You should always cite the person. But I do believe it is fair to criticize the ideology of the individuals presenting science, so long as you're using it as an exploratory method to determine if there is fault within their research, not their moral character. Let me try and explain this idea a little better. If a feminist puts forth an idea that there is a patriarchy, I will say, okay, my first assumption is that you believe that based on your ideology. But I'm not going to say you're wrong because it's an ideology. I'm going to say I understand the perspective. Perhaps because of that perspective, you've excluded other relevant information. Thus, I will explore as a potential uh, way to view how you view the world. So to put it simply, in the discovery of DNA, this man... He's accused of being a racist and a sexist. Okay, does that mean his data is wrong? It doesn't, but it means that we can definitely look into and expand upon his research by making presumptions about what he may have omitted or assumed based on his own personal ideology. It's actually really a really good thing. And I think it's fair to say that, well, to, to reiterate, don't remove a citation to an individual because you think they're a bad person. But absolutely, we should go back to look at the, the research of individuals and check for assumptions the individual made. The data on DNA, for the most part, I think we know is true because we've done so much research beyond this. Does the, the, fact, that the, guy, uh, the fact that he's a racist change the fact that he made discoveries? Absolutely not. Is it, all, is, is it at all surprising that a man who, you know, from, uh, who is o as old as he is, I don't know his exact, exact age, but, you know, he, the, the DNA discovery stuff, this was decades ago. Is it a surprise that he's a racist? No, of course not. Scientists all throughout history probably were extremely racist because humans were extremely racist. And it's only in recent times that we're kind of chilling out on the racism. Even the people that I've met who are race realists, for the most part, don't hate people. I completely disagree with them. There are absolutely a ton of people who are race realists who are just awful people who mock and belittle and I would call racists. But there are certain people who believe that race and genetics are, are, are connected and that there are certain genetic factors to race that, you know, I wouldn't necessarily agree with in a lot of it, in circumstances who aren't overly mean about it, right? They're not bad people. They might just have bad ideas. And, if you, and, and so what we need to consider when it comes to science and truth and social justice, someone might approach a topic and say, I don't believe this to be true, so I refuse to explore it. That is an ideolo ideological roadblock to the research. If we truly want to understand an idea, it would be amazing to recognize ideological presumptions made by the individuals doing the research. Thus, when we have a thousand individuals across all demographics, various cultures, doing research in a similar area, we can say there may not be an ideological barrier to, uh, to this information. 
it, it's probably sound. This is one of the areas where I think we can say that diversity is a really good thing. And, and, and let me just clarify before wrapping up. The general idea is, if you do have a white man doing research on race and genetics, people might question the data based on his race, and incorrectly too. However, it may also be true that if the individual is racist, they may, they may make assumptions about behaviors and race. However, if you have that scientist doing the work, overseas you have an Indian science do, uh, scientist doing the work, in Africa you have a Nigerian scientist doing the work or a Kenyan scientist, we can then say, look, all of these different scientists of different backgrounds and races concluded a very similar finding. Therefore, your presumption that ideology is getting in the way is incorrect. Or the group can find other things and we can say, maybe this researcher made mistakes based on their assumptions. Humans are fallible, absolutely. And diversification, decentralization is a fascinating thing when it comes to scientific research. This is why I try to explain to people that what the left is pushing in terms of diversity is bastardizing and ruining the real idea of what diversity is. So let me just lay out good diversity one last time before we wrap up. In Western society, in the United States, we have core tenets, we have a constitution, we have rules. So long as everyone agrees to that, we have a monoculture, an overarching monoculture, that's a good thing. Underneath the monoculture, we can have multiculturalism. You have Chinatown, you have Ukrainian Village, Little Italy, these, these, these towns where different cultures exist so long as they adhere to the underlying principles of liberal democracy. That means you can't uphold a religious law against, you know, uh, against other people and certain people. You can do things on your own personal level for sure because people are free to do that. That is where multiculturalism makes sense. And this is where I think people on the left and the right kind of don't understand the general idea. If you're calling for one country with no overarching principles, multiculturalism doesn't make sense because then people will start fighting each other because they disagree on the basic principles of what is right and wrong. But with that overarching principle within that, diversity is a good thing. So long as everyone can agree to basic rules, diversity is great because you'll have different viewpoints. Absolutely. 100%. And you know what? Feel free to argue with me, but, it, but I believe this is, a, a, this is to be true. And I want to say that my main gripe with the far left is this false idea of diversity where they think that they don't respect diversity of opinion, which is literally what you're looking for. The idea is that someone who grows up in a Latino neighborhood is going to have a different view and opinion as the white person. They might not. And race isn't the great defining factor. The great factor in diversity is a different life experience. And this comes from people sometimes based on race and gender, national origin. But for the most part, the idea is that diversity is good in terms of genetics, and it's good in terms of perception and, 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 and research and things of this nature, only so long as we can all agree to some basic rules as an overarching monoculture. It's complicated, but I'm going to leave it at that. And I got another story coming up in just a few minutes. I don't know what this next one is, but uh, stick around anyway.